Um, my name is Louisa Wood Ruby. I'm head of research here at the Frick Art Reference Library. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening to our panel, Entering the Art Market, Collectors and Their Passions, sponsored by the Frick Center for the History of Collecting in coordination with Christie's Education. In case you didn't realize it, this is a two-part event. The second part um, will be in November 6th at Christie's from 10 to 12 in the morning, where specialists will facilitate previews of the upcoming Impressionist and Modern Art and post-war and contemporary art sales. Um, that event is also currently full, but if you'd like to add, be added to the wait list for that, please see either Julie Reese or Veronique chagnon burke after the panel, and they're right here. So you could just meet them, and we will have wine after the event, so you could also talk to them at that point. The idea to host an event of this nature came from the desire to reach out to a group of people who, while they might be interested in learning from the center's usual symposia about large and well-known collections from the Renaissance through the Gilded Age, might also be interested in getting, to, uh, getting started forming a collection of their own. For this reason, we thought we should not only facilitate visits to an auction house for interested newcomers, but convene a panel with a moderator and two collectors who are passionate about art and can lend us a personal take on entering the market how they got started, why, what their earliest purchases were, and some of their most interesting wins and losses. Our center advisory board members, Barbara Fleischman and Dr. Stephen Schur, were particularly pleased that we took this on, as they would like everyone to appreciate the joy they have had in forming their own collections. Luckily for us, Nana Decking, founder and CEO of Artery, advocate for transparency in the market, and chairman of TAFOF, which opens next week. And I believe that Artery is also launching the following week, so it's a very busy time for uh, Mr. Decking. Um, Nana eagerly took on the task of moderator for our panel, and soon we were also able to entice both Bernard Lumpkin and Ann Tenenbaum to join us. I'm extremely grateful to all three for agreeing to be here tonight, and look forward to their discussion with great pleasure. Thank you, Louise, as always. It's uh, an honor to be included in, uh, in events over here, especially now with uh, Anne and Bernard, a very passionate collector. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have been asked to moderate this panel. Uh, I, I don't actually think you need me here because the two of them can just talk without me and I will <laughs> be sitting with you. Uh, maybe I tell you just a few lines about Artry because uh, we are indeed going to launch. And I think for collectors it will be extremely important to see what we're doing. It's going to be a digital registry with verified information about artworks, meaning that if there is a dealer who has the guts to actually create a public record about what he or she just told the client when the client bought an artwork, then it will show up as a verified record signed off by one of those trusted entities on the registry. Well, that will all be live in a few weeks' time. Hopefully, you will read a little bit about it. Um, but now to what you're actually here for. Uh, two wonderful collectors, but before we start with um, talking about them as collectors, uh, Anne, I would like to start with you. And while I'm actually talking to Anne, you will see parts of her collection rotating on the screen, and she has an absolutely incredible collection. So um, I'm, I'm always thinking about when you go to like a parent-teacher evening, and you're all of a sudden just, you have one ent identity, you're just the father of your child, and now you're just a collector. But maybe before we start talking about your collection, can you tell the audience a little bit about what you do in your day-to-day -day life, apart from sure. collecting? Yeah. Sure, I, I am passionate about all the arts, really, and um, so I serve on a number of boards uh, at the moment, the Metropolitan Museum Board, the Studio Museum in Harlem Board with Bernard, um, and I chair the board of film at Lincoln Center, which just finished our film fest New York Film Festival, um, So, and then some education boards as well. Uh, my sons are at Tulane, and I've joined the board there, and um, so I spend a lot of time doing board work um, and, you know, a few kids and a husband, and you're done. <laughs> well, that sounds like a, like a very full life, a New, a New York life, I would call it. Yes, um, yes, very much so. And next to that, you even have time to collect. And, and, and maybe we start to, to, <laughs> to just, you, we, we will talk only about collecting, don't worry, but I think maybe f before we, we move to Bernard, 
Can, can you just tell us, because there, there are, we always say like everyone is a collector. A child that goes to the beach picks up five shells and that's then maybe your first collection. Were, were you one of those collectors who actually, from, from child onwards, knew I really want to own something special, I want to put that in a specific context? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I mean, I liked, I liked books and I bought books. I never thought of them as part of a collection or um, I, I never had a goal to have a collection or be a collector. Um, I am a very um, intuitive person. I live my life intuitively by my gut mostly. And so for me, it was really about having the opportunity to go to galleries or auction houses, see things that I just, you know, uh, reacted to and then actually be able to buy them. Um, it was a happy coincidence, but not a plan ever. Well, we're going to find out a little bit how that coincidence actually happened later, but let, let's move on uh, to Bernard. So also to you the question, apart from being a collector, what, what is your, your day-to-day -day business activities? Uh? Uh, well, before we began our formal proceeding, uh, the three of us were talking about um, raising children in the art world, So, which I think we're um, uh, privileged to have time to be um, time for our passion in terms of collecting and being patrons, but also raising children. I feel that, uh, I guess I'm sort of a half and my half time with the kids and half time with the other kids being artists. Um, being a supporter and an advocate for emerging artists means that I get the pleasure and privilege of working with um, artists that are not necessarily much older than college students and are figuring out their way in the art world and that means uh, an exciting opportunity for an interested patron and an engaged patron to have a big impact on an artist's life, not only by collecting their work, uh, but also by supporting them in the many different ways that artists need support. And so I find that frequently when I'm, you know, picking up my kids from school or involved in some parent PTA meeting at their kindergarten, I'm also simultaneously thinking about or advising or talking to an artist about a studio or a studio, a problem with their studio, a problem with their dealer, um, something related to a show they have coming up, and I feel like it's different kinds of parenting. That's wonderful. But let's stay with you and, and, and go a little bit deeper about the art before we move back to Anne. Um, so when did that start, this whole idea? Uh, I want to be engaged with that community, which most likely then led, I want to buy art. When, when did that start? Is there sort of a defining moment that you can remember or a I mean, period in your life? It is interesting, your question to Anne, um, who I've enjoyed so much listening to, because we sit next to each other in board meetings at the Studio Museum, but we are always talking about museum business and not our own business, which is uh, great for that setting, but it's nice also to hear more. And uh, listening to Anne and your question about, you know, were we, what's inspired us to become collectors? And I think as a kid, I collected stamps. Um, but I think, so a little bit of that, I think maybe more so was my uncle, um, Uncle Wally, who took me to the Watts Towers in Watts, Los Angeles, where my father's and his brother, my father and his brothers grew up. And it was my first exposure to, I was, you know, eight or nine, it was my first exposure to art. And it was art that wasn't happening inside of a museum or it wasn't sort of in that part of town. It was in my father's neighborhood and there was this amazing sculpture, which was art, but it certainly didn't look like a painting that you would see here in the Frick or it didn't look like a museum, it wasn't a museum setting. And I remember it had a big impression upon me because I remember thinking like, oh, for, you can be an artist and an artist can be involved with the community and art can happen in the community and it can be a part of the daily life of the community. Um, so I think some of the roots of you know, my uncle's sort of interest in art and collecting and his taking me to the Watts Towers and then subsequently taking me to auctions and other things gave me a sense of you know, the kind of collector I wanted. I can look back and I can say that it planted a seed of the kind of collector I wanted to be, which was a collector which, who supported artists in 
the context of a broader community. And I think that's how, I think collecting for me is sort of one quarter of what I do and patronage is really 75% of what I do. And I certainly, they're symbiotic and I think that anybody starting out collecting should recognize that if you really want to engage in supporting artists that the best way to do that is to do that through the museums and the other art institutions that support artists. So that was an early example. So this, this whole idea that you had, I want to be engaged with that community, ultimately led to an acquisition. Do you, do you remember what was sort of the first acquisitions or acquisition? I mean... And, 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 and when was that? How long ago? I mean, I think, you know, I get, often get that question, what was the first work you bought? Or what was the favorite work? And I think for me, again, getting back to this idea of sort of sustained engagement with an artist, you know, I was interested from that time that my uncle took me to the Watts Towers. I was obviously interested in artists of color and African-American artists. It was, part, it was my family background on my father's side. Um, you know, my mother was, uh, came from Morocco. She was Sephardic Jewish. So I've had a very interesting sort of perspective as, um, you know, as a collector and I'm drawn to and interested in those artists that are thinking about identity and the complexity of identity. Um, you don't have to be mixed race or having been raised Jewish and Christian to appreciate that, but I think it helps and I think it helps drive my passion for artists of color. Um, and so I think an early example to, to answer your question, I would say someone like Henry Taylor, which I think I have a, a painting up there, was an artist who was coincidentally from Los Angeles also. And he was the first artist that I realized that there was more to just buying a painting here or acquiring an artwork. It was sort of, I met the artist, um, I knew other collectors who were supporting him, and it, I realized that this is the difference between just collecting art and supporting an artist. And also the difference between you know, buying something and sort of hanging it in your home and sort of waiting and seeing what happens and engaging with an artist and with the other people who are supporting that artist and really beginning to build, like being, the, having that excitement that you can be a part of something, that you could be a part of making an artist's career, not just sort of reaping the benefits of all their work that they did. It's a bit of a holistic question maybe, but because I know the artwork, because I've seen it. Um, so what was more important for you, the, the connection with the artist or ac the actual artwork? Um, because it's, it's so interesting what you say, you, 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 you collect with a very clear idea. It has a lot to do with connection, with identity. But at a certain moment, you make that selection and you actually started talking about the artist and then about the artwork. But what, what, is there sort of a moment that you thought that that's the artwork that I really want to own? I mean, I think with Anne, I don't know, we might have talked about this, but you know, when you're collecting living artists, it's, easier and it's more interesting to get involved with the sort of, as you say, the holistic experience of supporting an artist. Um, and I have relationships with a lot of the artists that I collect. I mean, they have, I feel like they're part of an extended family. It's just, it happens that way. It happens through the studio museum. We have an amazing artist in residence program uh, where many artists have come through and gone on to, to have incredible careers. And Thelma, our amazing director, encourages, I think, the patrons of the museum to really be a part of the life of the museum. And I think that I've sort of taken her approach as, you know, an institutional leader, which is, you know, has to do with creating space, it has to do with the museum being an integral part of the community of Harlem. Um, and I think that I've sort of taken that and applied it to my own collecting. And I think when I speak with other collectors and patrons like Anne, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy is just talking about the artists that we know and... Sure, you know. yeah. So Anne, with you, it was somewhat differently. Um, oh, Bernard's <laughs> making me look really bad. No. <laughs> Shallow, <laughs> self-indulgent. That's not, not, the, not in the least, of very course. Very embarrassing. Um, but Sorry. this is actually, no, it's, 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 it's very interesting to, to, because you did become a collector. Um, whether you like it or not. So there must have been that particular moment where you thought, that's what I want. Do you, do you remember that? What is, what, because at a certain moment you started to buy art and not, not a little bit, you bought Well, a what happened actually <laughs> What actually was, happened? I, um, I met my husband, now husband, um, who grew up in a family in Boston um, 
his mother was a bit of an art dealer and started some museums and was deeply involved in the art world. And he grew up, you know, in a collection, knowing art that way and um, hanging art in his mother's gallery. And he was getting divorced. And um, he was, you know, said to me, showed me his art collection that he had collected with his first wife and said, what do you think? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, all right, we're going to start over. So who said that you didn't have an interesting story here? <laughs> <laughs> it's just not as um, impressive, that's all. Um, so we started collecting together and, I mean, started buying art literally to, you know, hang on the walls. It, it wasn't, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go collect art now. I, I, I just didn't think that way. Right. Um, and so he said, why don't you go to some auctions and take a look? Okay, and I knew a little bit about art. I, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. My parents, um, I'm Jewish, my parents loved art. They had a little bit, they didn't really have enough money to collect art. They actually belonged to something called the Print of the Month Club, which existed in the 60s, and you could buy prints for, you know, very little money, $25, um, and it was a subscription thing. So we did have art in our house, um, but it was actually a little bit of a source of anxiety for me because um, it, we were kind of outsiders in, in the community. Not really, I mean, we were insiders, but we lived a different way, and my friends would <laughs> come over and make fun of what was on our walls because and the way we lived, it was very foreign to them. And um, so I was a little embarrassed um, about art, but I always was attracted to it. And so Tom said, go, go to an auction. So I went to a day auction at Sotheby's. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew a little bit about artists, which, but they were all dead. Which year we, are we talking here? Which year was that? 1993. Okay. Um, you know, I knew about abstract expressionist, but I didn't know about really much about living artists. And this um, painting picture came up, and I didn't know what it was, but I thought it was incredible. I just, the colors and the um, vibrancy of it and the image, and, and it was a Basquiat. I don't know, I'd never heard of Basquiat, and I thought, that is amazing. I, I, need, I need to live, I love that. I need to look at that. And you really more. had no idea who Basquiat no, was. No, I really at the time. had no yeah. idea. <laughs> um, and um, so I bought it. And, you know, it wasn't particularly expensive at the time. <laughs> and that just, and then it just kept going and going. And, um, I, I, you know, it turned out I had a bit of an eye. So um, that was lucky. That was not a bad start, I have to say. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And, um, you know, it, it did. It's funny because I didn't pay a lot and I didn't know what I was doing. And it's, it's a very um, coveted piece at this point. Right. So that's how I got involved. And I, I mean, honestly, if I hadn't met my husband, I would not be collecting art. I, I would buy a piece here and there. Actually, when I graduated college, my parents asked me what I wanted for graduation, and I said I wanted a piece of art, and they bought me a piece of art. So I would have had, you know, here and there, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have um, had the opportunity to go deeply into it. So you find yourself at Sotheby's, most likely at the time, with your husband. No, actually, no. You went by yourself. No. He, he had some people that were helping him, like art advisors, but I didn't, you know, well, I didn't even like, know what that's that exactly meant. where I wanted to go. But because yeah. it's like, how? But I, I said, love this. I love this. So you yeah. go to Sotheby's. You manage not to be stalked by all those people who try to sell you something, and you independently walk into the building and and see a painting that you like. Is that, is that how it went? Yes, that's how it went. And <laughs> and this woman was an art advisor for Tom and his uh, first life, and. You know, I said, I want to buy that. And she said, well, you didn't even see it. You don't know if it's in good condition. You know, I said, I don't care. I want to buy it. That's what I'm here for. I want to buy it. And she said, OK, well, it is an artist, you know, that, that's a, re it's a real artist. So OK, you can buy it. 
Um, Her assessment was it's a real artist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a lot. That's <laughs> for five <Yeah>. percent. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you know, I I have always resisted buying what I should buy or uh, what people tell me I should like. I I have always only bought what I wanted to live with. Well, we, we, we go a little bit deeper on that because that's really interesting. But let's let's go back to Bernard for a second. So I'm learning a lot listening to <laughs> Anne. Yeah, I love no. this. So so Anne basically has the eye, which is great, and she's clearly not helped by art advisors. Right. Uh, you already started to say, um, for me, the environment of a museum is extremely important, and we talk about that later with you, of course, as well. But what is, what what is for you the help that you get, or what makes you? make up your mind when you have to make the decision, do I want something or not? I mean, I think, you know, the advisor question I often get also, and I'm, I'm, the way I answer that is always, yes, I have many art advisors, curators, other collectors, museum directors, um, educators, artists. So I think, you know, any person starting out in collecting should avail themselves of all of the you know, every, if you have a job, you have colleagues, you have mentors, you have people who help make connections for you, show you how to learn. And I think the art world, one of the most, one of the, you know, beautiful things about the art world is that it's this multifaceted, there's a nonprofit side, there's a commercial side, there's art schools, there's art auctions. And I feel like to be a good collector, you really should build relationships within all those different communities so that when you make decisions about acquisitions or when you make decisions around you know, a museum to support, you do so from kind of an informed perspective. Um, it's also sort of you know, my approach, which is I think like Anne's is you know, go with your gut and train your eye. So you know, it's not such a matter of, yes, of course you should always buy with your eyes and not with your ears, as probably you've heard. You know, educate yourself about what you like, what you respond to. But um, you know, do that in a way that's sort of deliberate, and that you know that takes time and it takes research. And uh, museums or arts organizations, or um, you know, I'm also on the board of the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, which is a residency up in Maine, which has trained a lot of um, great artists over the years. And also, the Yale School of Art is an academic institution. Obviously, a very prominent art school also produces a lot of great artists. So I've aligned myself with those institutions because that aligns with my focus as a collector, being emerging artists. Um, and I think that's how you learn, and that's how you, you know, no one teaches you how to be a patron. I mean, you can grow up around art or not necessarily, but I think you still have to learn by doing, and doing in the art world means looking at a lot of art and talking to artists and doing research, doing homework. And next to being part of that whole milieu, so to say, where you can actually learn a lot and the two of you can actually give back a lot to these institutions as well. Um, are you still online and go through auction catalogs? Uh, do you still go to the galleries? Do you go to the art fairs? Uh, because I totally, I think this is a great piece of advice for everyone who collects, right? Find a museum that reflects your collection category and be involved. And I think that's, that's wonderful advice. But, but apart from that, uh, you, you, you must get a lot of information I, in different ways as well. I think so. I mean, for me, art fairs have meant different things at different times in my collecting career. Now, it's almost like an industry conference. And you just go because... Everyone, everybody's there, so that's why you go. And particularly as the art market has become more global, whatever your specific focus is, there are now people around the world who are working on that in that area as well, whether they're a dealer or a collector. So you, you want to be at the places where everybody comes together from around the world. And you know, with so much happening in the art world around you know, the whole digitization, the, the rise of technology and the access to information as your company is so you know is a really important step in that direction transparency and equal access to information nothing replaces a face to face meeting with an artist you can't do a studio visit online you can't look at a work and have the reaction that Anne did when she saw that Basquiat without even knowing who Basquiat was but she had a gut reaction and realized that that was something that that she wanted, and that doesn't happen in a digital way, or reliably, or... Totally true, yeah. yeah. 
actually just for, that's the only thing I will say about art week and then I stop. But artists can actually cryptographically sign off on these documents and they cannot be altered. So I think artists are of course incredibly important uh, and nothing digital can replace that. Um, but to, to you back. Uh, well, I was yeah, thinking about you. the art yeah. fair question yeah. and um, for me, I, I sometimes go to art fairs. The problem is I go to art fairs and I buy things that I have no place to put. And, um, but I do, for me, they can be a place of discovery. Um, like it happened to me at Freeze New York last spring. Um, I was walking around and a dealer had a show of these gorgeous pieces. I didn't know what they were. They were these beautiful resin pieces. And it turned out they were an artist named Fred Eversley, um, an older black gentleman who had been doing uh, pieces in light and space, um, which I'm very interested in also. And, uh, you know, had, because he was black and working like, with James Terrell and the, you know, Smiths and nobody paid attention to him, they didn't care. So he's had a resurgence, his work has become, um, known and coveted. Anyway, I'd never heard of him. I'd never seen his work. And, or maybe I'd seen it, but I hadn't really paid attention. And I saw, I'm sorry, at a gallery, they had a whole booth of it, and of his work, and I just was like, oh my God, I, I, this is incredible. Um, and so that does happen. I don't get to galleries so much, you know, like wandering around, maybe on occasion for an appointment of something I really want to see, but I don't quite have the so leisure time to walk. So is typically at an art fair. Typically. Yeah, typically at yep. an art fair. Yep. And, and, and then you still buy at auction. You know, I haven't bought at auction in a long time, actually. Me neither. Yeah, That's I don't know. I, interesting. I, yeah. Um, it's harder to make discussions. I get the discovery part at an art fair, and that's really true. Like, because it's a lot of good art. Like, whatever whatever else you have to say about art fairs or whatever art fair you you know you love to hate, it's a lot of good art in one place at one time, and you can learn a lot, and you can. But make that's also why if something <laughs> if something really grabs you, because they're you know five right. million pieces of art, and they right. all start to look alike after a while. So if something grabs you at an art fair, true, it's, very, it's a visceral reaction. Right. And I, for me, that's um, I like you know I really like that moment of knowing of like being hit in the you know heart by it. Um, what was the last time that happened? That Fred Eversley. That Fred Eversley. Yeah. 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 Right. And these days, I really try not to buy things if I don't have that reaction because right. I really don't have any, you know, business buying things anymore. But I can't, you know, you see these amazing things and there's so many incredible artists out there. Right. Um, but if you don't go out, you don't see them, which sometimes I, that's how I control myself. So we have two passionate collectors here, each in their, in the, in their own way, which is always good. Uh, well, there must have been a moment that you thought, that artwork, I want to have it. Because in the end, we, you may as, know as many artists as you know, as many curators as you know, but there must have been a moment in your collecting experience where you just, the greed came up, and I really want to have that. Yeah, that picture right there oh. for me, that's the one. Perfect timing, <laughs> yeah, good. Right. I, um, when I moved to New York, I, a friend of mine had a poster of that image, that Edward Weston photograph, um, over her sofa in 1983. And I had never, I, had, I knew who Edward Weston was a little bit, but I had never seen that image. And I just, I don't know, I, I just loved that image. It, it, um, and I spent years, literally years, walking into every poster store, which they used to have back then, um, on 8th Street, or if I was in London, or if I was in Paris, every single poster store looking for that poster that she had, never, ever found the poster. And then I, when I met Tom, my husband, and started collecting, I was, I, I did always have a, um, a, a soft spot for photography. And so I was looking at catalogs and things at that point, and I saw a picture of that image in a catalog, and I knew it wasn't 
very expensive. So I knew it wasn't, probably wasn't a great image, but um, I just had never seen it again, except in like Weston's notebooks, you know, reproduced in his notebooks that he wrote. So I bought it and put it in my wall and, you know, I loved it. But I knew it wasn't a great print. Um, and then one day I walked into an art fair um, at the Armory, and I think it was like 1999 at that point, and there was that a gorgeous print of that was hanging on an art dealer's wall, and I, I literally walked in and said, I, I'll take it. I didn't even ask how much it was. I didn't bother negotiating. I just, I, I really had to have that. Uh, and it is one of my... Um, so I, one I of your favorite my, pieces? Yeah. yeah, I hung it in, in our bathroom, so I look at it you know, all the time. Oh, beautiful story. Yeah. Bernard, do you have a story like that, where I, greed I came up? <laughs> <laughs> it did chase. Oh, gosh. I don't, it's funny, I was sitting here listening to this, and I should... I should you were I not preparing many, the answer. <laughs> I have many, I was trying, I was thinking, oh my God, they're going to ask me the same question <laughs> next, and I'm not going to... I mean, I have a... F one story, one time early, um, early on when I started focusing on artists and African-American artists and there was a um, I forget it was at the Armory show and it was a shelf piece by Rasheed Johnson and um, I saw it and I loved it and I it was really not the, an easy piece to hang in your home sort of like Carol Bove like it has shells and plants on it and, and I knew Rasheed at this point I sort of to your question about the artist or the artwork I think I knew him better than then I had sort of collected him, but I I saw the the piece and it was in a booth and I you know I was it was early on so I was like okay is it available can I buy it and the the dealer said sure but being an art fair you sort of have to make the decision more quickly um, and so I said okay <laughs> but the story continues because. I think I went to get like a check or something. I, I, I remember something about a check. And it's like, he's like, well, how do you want to pay? And I said, well, can I write you a check? And he said, sure. So anyway, I went to get a check. And then when I came back, he pulled me aside and he said, so, <laughs> always what you want to hear from a dealer, something has happened. And I said, okay. And he said, there's this um, institute in Italy and sort of a public art foundation. And my frame of reference for that at that point was sort of like, like, uh, you, do you mean the Rebels collection? And he said, yeah, sort of like the Rebels collection, but in Italy, I forget, we're in Italy. And he said, you know, they came in after you came into the booth and they said they would really love to have this piece. It's the first major work by Rashid Johnson in Italy. And it's, you know, it's meant to be, you know, this is a piece which, you know, would be amazing in a public collection. And I said, yeah, it would be amazing in my collection too. But, <laughs> but, and this is sort of my early, one of my early sort of moments where am I a collector or a patron, you know, and I, am I going to sort of fight for this piece for my own collection or am I going to try to, you know, do right by the artist or at least what the dealer was telling me was right by the artist. And thankfully I knew the artist, so I sort of said, okay, let me talk to Rashid about this. So I confirmed it with Rashid that in fact this, um, this sort of, you know, public art place in Italy was interested in the piece and he had, that he really wanted the piece to go there. And so we worked out whereby I would make, he would make something similar for me. And so that had a happy ending. So I was happy letting the piece go. And I was happy sort of building a relationship with the artist that sort of demonstrated that, you know, obviously I'm a collector but I'm a patron first and that I wouldn't get in the way of a museum or an institution. Obviously when we're on the boards of museums, you have to be mindful of that, that when you're in the boardroom and you're supporting a museum, your first priority, your first allegiance is to the institution. And this was sort of an early example and I kind of stumbled my way into it, but I was glad that I think it taught me something which I then took, you know, well, it was non-selfish yeah. greed, so to say. It was yeah. non-selfish greed, right. And there's always, I think someone, another collector told me, it's like, Bernard, there's always another one. They can always make another one. And it's a good thing to remember when you're... If they're alive. 
That's true. <laughs> Another reason why it's good to collect. Even when they're not alive. Artists. Yeah, even when they're not alive, right. Be, be wary of any dealer who tells you there's always another one. Um, but we, we, yeah. we, we the, the dead artist, I wanted to talk about the dead <laughs> artist as well. Because we're, what, what, what we hear from you, of course, is very, very important, a very good lesson, is when you are still able to engage with living artists, uh, it adds a lot of value, personal value, but it potentially actually adds a lot of value to your artwork as well. Um, but some artists die, and their, their art is also for sale. Uh, so let's, go, let's move to the secondary market. Because having been a dealer in the secondary market, French Impressionism, I know that then the whole trust factor plays a big role. And I don't want to feel sorry for the dealer po population, but I have to say it's not always easy to stand there in a room next to someone who can potentially buy a 20 to $30 million painting, and it's all built on trust. Um, the last thing I say about Art Read, that's what we try to, con <laughs> to conquer with our <laughs> registry. But that whole feeling that you have to be trusted, me as a dealer in those days, what does it do for you as the collector? Because you, you, you're going to spend a lot of money, the artist is dead, uh, you're dependent on, on committees who, who don't say anything, they basically tell you it will be included in the forthcoming Catalog resume, which will never be published. So you're you're on your own. Yeah, how, again, how is I that feeling? Anne? I don't care about that. Yeah. I never cared about that. If I loved it, I just didn't care. Yeah. It wasn't. People do. Many people do. Um, but that was not my objective. You know, I. So I didn't. I never even asked that stuff. I guess the best safeguard really is that buy what you love. <clears throat> whatever happens yeah. to the artist, I mean, hopefully you're not buying a counterfeit work of art, but if you love the work, then whatever happens to the artist or the career or the value of the specific work, you will always enjoy living with it. Have you ever seen a work that you wanted and you thought, I want to do some fact-checking here? And if so, what kind of fact-checking did you do? Did you use someone? Did you go online? What just, I mean, these... Oh, These definitely. Are all collectors here. What, mean, what would you advise? Yes, especially you know if they're more expensive, um, and we always have had uh, an ad advisory service for cataloging purposes and you know loans and things. There's a lot of movement, uh, and keeping records is important, um, especially if you keep buying things. Uh, so yes, m very often um, I would. You know, you don't want to be stupid. You don't want to pay ten times what it's worth. So I, I would definitely check, um, have them check mostly to make sure that the so condition. In your case, to make sure it's not yeah. stolen, to make yeah. sure it's in the right condition, and that you're not paying a, an right. incredibly ridiculous price. Um, I hope people don't mind. I want to be a bit, little bit more granular because since we like collecting, I think it's important to understand. So. The condition is another element of the work. Do you typically trust the condition report you get from the dealer, or do you have your own advisors who look at, at, at the condition of an artwork? Normally, I like to go, you know, put an eye on it, either mine or an advisor's. Um, not that I don't necessarily trust the dealers, but, um, you know, I think it's better to just take a look. Sure. Sometimes there can be condition issues that just you don't care about so much. You know, a tiny chip in something that was a ceramic piece from 1949 that you really can't see the chip, you know. Um, and sometimes they're egregious and, and no one told the truth. So, so, so do, do you collect art from dead artists, so I to mean, say? It's, it's interesting, the, con the question of <laughs> condition... Um, you know, the things that you check. Uh, obviously, it's a different set of criteria for dead artists and living artists, I think. Um, but it still comes to bear. I remember we looked at, and again, this is another sort of pitch for building, you know, a community of advisors around you through, through institutions, which is there was an artist, David Hammond, um, prominent African-American conceptual artist, still living, very old. But um, his work is often very fragile and sort of based on ephemeral objects like hair or, um, you know, hair or clothing. And so 
condition reports in this case with a living artist, I think is you're verifying the authenticity of the work and also if there are issues with the material that is made that might be problematic either for your own collection or for resale or for, that might violate laws. And the durability of what they have created, right? That's something that you, at that stage, now want to check. Right, right. Well, so the vulnerability, sorry. Right. Yeah, the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, and so I think a couple times we asked a conservator at MoMA to take a look at um, David Hammond's makes body, one of the, his bodies of works are body prints, which, um, you know, frequently work by African American artists or other artists wasn't valued and so therefore wasn't very well cared, you know, cared for. And so people would frame things in the wrong frames or they would end up in closets. And so I think that's, you know, having a conservator when you're talking about paper, for instance, is really important to take a look at something. Photos, for sure, especially, right. well, any photos, you know, because right. they do have condition issues or, um, and, and sometimes you, they don't have condition issues when you buy them, and then they do later. I bought, I have a Diane Arbus uh, woman in a park photo that um, is turning yellow. And, you know, I bought it a long time ago. It was in beautiful condition. No one, there was no reason to think that there was anything wrong. It's yellow, <laughs> and it's no longer, you know, really a, valuable print. Right, right. And it's not anything anyone did except Diane Arbus, um, you know, or the, the material she used when she printed it, so. So hopefully that's what people will start to accept, that when these artworks age, they will look differently. I mean, Van yes. Gogh's look completely different than they did in his lifetime. Right. It didn't take a little bit more time to get in that state, but still. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Yes, you will have the chance to, to get to ask questions, but I want to ask two more questions. Um, so you have a collection, and it's, you already said my, my, my walls are full, and I'm sure your, your walls, are, walls are completely covered as well, so you must have storages, etc. Do you sell? Um, let's start with you. And why would you sell, or do you sell? I mean, this whole would idea. Would I tell you if I did? <laughs> um. You don't have to. <laughs> but you have to tell them. I... <laughs> How do, I, how do I answer this? I, I try really hard not to sell. Um, and frequently when, I, when the, we sort of began to focus the collection around, you know, younger artists, artists of color, there were works that just no longer fit the story that we wanted to tell with the collection. And um, so we sold those. But we sold them, you know, in the way that one is supposed to sell work, which is to sell it at the source where you acquired it. So I think one was a photograph or it was, um, it was, uh, uh, I'll remember the name of the artist, but it was from a benefit auction, White Columns, and so we took it back to White Columns, obviously being a nonprofit, it would be good for them to benefit from the sale in some way, so that's what we did. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, and, and yeah. To end, and now, now I have to ask you the terrible question, <laughs> because you didn't answer it. Uh, so you, you obviously have an eye. Uh, Basquiat is uh, also an extremely, extremely expensive artist. Do you sometimes sell because well, you think the tempting. value has gone up so much? <laughs> it is much tempting that. sometimes. You know, you paid X not very and, and much. Fifty X now, yeah. um, and twenty-five years later, it's. Somebody says, oh, I'll give you some crazy amount of money. And you think, oh, I don't know, I don't know. What can I do with that? I, you know, for me, it comes down to how much I love the picture. And like my Basquiat, I've been offered um, quite a lot of money for it, especially after it was in this Basquiat show uh, last year in, uh, in, in Paris. But I just can't. I can't. I want to live with it. I want to see it. Um, I, the there same the passion comes in yeah. for that piece for sure I, there are some pieces we, it's happened before we had a, a painting a great painting but that I didn't love so much somebody walked into our house one day and said we'll give you some seriously ridiculous amount of money and, and my husband and I looked at each other and we said eh, you know okay <laughs> we like it but we don't like it that much <laughs> bye um, 
so it does happen. My, you know, tastes change too sometimes. Um, and so there have been things that that I we've sold because we didn't love them as much anymore. Um, but mostly, no. Mostly I don't sell. Well, it's very refreshing not to sit here with two flippers who sit at the front row oh, at the no. auction houses and see, when, oh, there's no bidding here, let's get it, and try to sell it within two years. Oh, no, I, that's, yeah. uh, I don't have any interest in that. I, I don't, that's not my... So um, you really hurt an artist's career do, doing that, especially for younger artists. And you just have to be aware of that, that if you know, no one's going to tell you how to be a collector or how to, how to buy art, but just be aware that certain things that you do will be viewed a certain way, and then you might find it hard to buy in the future. Yeah. So Anne already mentioned that her Basquiat was very much in demand after this exhibition. So we all know that public exposure of artworks at the right exhibitions actually adds value to artworks as well. Um, so the public exposure of your art collection, is that something that keeps you busy, that you're curating? We're, we're here with two angels, basically, because they, they do everything the right way, and they, the way they engage with museums is incredible. They let artworks go because it's better for the career of the artworks. I can tell you, I've been a dealer myself. This is very atypical. <laughs> <laughs> but we can still learn a lot of, of how to collect here. But um, is, is public exposure for you of your collection, is that important? And, and how do you curate that? Is, is there a plan that this is what I actually want to tell the world with my collection? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, Anne and I are both uh, obviously enjoy hosting events in our homes for the organizations that we're involved with. People come over, people who know the artists that we collect and appreciate it. And I feel like, you know, in my particular case, supporting younger artists, I love being able to create a space. Um, you know, Thelma Golden does this at the Studio Museum by creating a space where artists and the community and people come together in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. And I think you can do that in your own home. You can create a space where you can connect young artists with potential dealers, curators, other collectors. I love doing that. Um, both my parents were educators. I think I've always approached collecting with sort of a civic, a sense of civic duty, if you might call it that, in the art world. I know that sounds rarefied, and, but you know, I think that you can approach art collecting that way, and so I try to um, share the collection as much as possible. I think collecting, you know, can be about possession and um, property and privacy, but it can also be about sharing and community. Um, we frequently, uh, recently we were asked, a small college in uh, Westchester, Concordia College, wanted to do a show featuring artists of African descent on campus. There were lots of discussions about race and identity on campus, and they had read something about our collection. And, and so now we have part of our collection on view at this college in uh, Westchester, which is a totally new experience. And, you know, again, very public in a way that goes beyond even, you know, having your home open to public events. Uh, and we're hoping to travel the show. So I think the mission, you know, you should collect as your passion leads you. And for, you know, for me, that was always the idea of sort of education in, in that way. Right. And with your collection, what is yeah, the I, public I kind of side of, of what you're doing? Definitely yeah. um, believe in getting it as, not as my collection, but getting these works out in front of as many people as possible. We always, I think there have only been one or two times in, in 25 years when we have not agreed to lend something, and it was because, um, you know, usually because the piece was so fragile that we were worried about it. Um, so I always lend when people ask, even sometimes it's three years. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I lent a, a photograph to a Diane Arbus retrospective, and I think four years later I said, is that, do I ever get that thing back? Like, traveling around the world, you know. It's, but I do, I believe strongly in that. And for me, um, whenever I can, you know, I imagine giving as much as I can to museums so that, it belongs to the world. Um, so, yes, I absolutely feel strongly you, about you that. You told me over the phone a little bit more about uh, the, the special relationship with the Metropolitan Museum. That yeah, so I'm, I'm on the board of the Met, as I said, and I, I got involved there through the photography department. Um, 
and someone introduced me to the then curator, Maria Hamburg, who was phenomenal. And we struck up a relationship and I you know, learned a lot about photography from her and I was buying more and more photography. Um, and then, I don't know, it turned out one day I, really, I had a photography collection that apparently is really, really good. So, um, so the head, new head of the department um, came to me like a year and a half ago and asked me if he could do a show of my photography collection at the Met for uh, the, the 150th anniversary. Right. Okay. And um, I thought it was just a ploy to get some pictures donated, which <laughs> probably was. But I said to him, you know, look, Jeff, you don't have to do a whole show. I'll, we can talk about a gift. I'll give you some pictures. And, and he said, no, it'll be fun. Let's do it. It'll be great. And I was, you know, a little shy about it. But in the end, he convinced me. And so in March, um, I think 70 pictures are going to be in a show uh, at the Met, uh, 57 of which um, are a promised gift to the Met. That's amazing. So, um, that's how to be a collector. Yeah. That's and, great. And, you know, I, honestly, I, I didn't think, of, I, I mean, I know I had great pictures, but like, kind of going down the list when we were talking about what's going to go in the show and what's not, you know, I realized, wow, there's some really fantastic things here that you can't replicate because most of them are from artists who are not alive. Um, and their vintage prints, you know, signed. This, this Cindy Sherman is one of them, actually. She is alive, but um, it's a, at this point, when I bought that, nobody wanted it. And again, it was like the year after I bought the Basquiat, and I didn't, again, didn't know who she was, but I love the image. Now you can't, there's no way to get your hands on one. And so, you know, I, I think the Met has arguably the best photography collection in the world. And they don't have that picture, and it's one of her most important. So they should have it to contextualize it, and um, you know, and tell the story of of art and humanity. And um, so, well, I, I hope have you to all say, come and see it. listening <laughs> listening to these lines and with what you started, I'm not a collector. I just started and I bought some things. Uh, I, I think there, a little bit more than that happened in, the, in, in, in your lifetime, and you're an amazing collector, and of course, you as well, where it's so much embedded in, 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 in the way you live and what you want to achieve in, in the world. So I think we all learned a lot, and there will be a chance to, to, to ask questions now. But I, I want to make one remark, though. What I'm learning here is what I really love, is there is no easy way to do anything in life. And you may be a billionaire, and you may think, I just walk into a gallery and I buy something for a hell of a lot of money and I try to flip it or whatever. All I hear from you is it's time consuming. You have to be really part of a community. You have to be able to give back. You have to be able to learn. So I, f I find it incredibly inspiring to hear this, really. Um, Questions? Louisa has a mic. Yeah, Samantha and I. Okay, there. Seriously, that's my husband who's going to ask a question. <laughs> I hope you're asking it of you know, Bernard. <laughs> uh, we heard a lot about photography tonight, but you didn't mention the three or four other areas that you have large collections and spend a lot of time in, such as ceramics, right. such as outdoor artists. Uh, like Heiser, which we, we did see, and... Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I have eclectic taste. I, I have an eclectic life, actually. I'm, maybe it's like adult onset ADD, but I'm like, I do a lot of different things. I, I have a hard time staying in one lane, so our collection reflects that. Um, and there are antiquities and paintings and a lot of ceramics. Um, which has been my little obsession the last maybe decade, um, and um, outdoor sculptures, and you know, just whatever it is that catches my eye. Oh yeah, I, I, my first art board that I was on was uh, Dia Center for the Arts, and that was early on in 1993. 
I joined, or four, I joined the board and I went out, took a trip out to see these Western projects, um, the uh, like Marfa for Donald Judd's project, James Terrell's Roden Crater, which hadn't even really started yet, um, Mike Heiser's City Project in the Desert, um, Spiral Jetty, uh, Smith, I, and I just, these projects to me were like, the greatest things I had ever seen in my entire life, and I got very obsessed with them. Um, most of them are not collectible, but um, we did have the great opportunity to buy a Mike Heiser piece a few years ago that um, that is in our um, out out in East Hampton at our house, and it's 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 stunning and phenomenal. And there it is. Um, <laughs> uh, right. And yeah, I, I was very involved in building uh, Beacon, I, you know. So I learned a lot about these artists, and um, I would say I am a little obsessed with them. It's funny because we had a symposium in the spring collecting the uncollectible, um, <laughs> and we did it in conjunction with Dia, and we oh. had Yarl Moan yeah, and exactly. um, Leonard Riggio came and. and um, the head of Dia interviewed them, so <laughs> we got oh, a good sense funny. from yes. them. <laughs> yeah. Bernard, since we're talking about a variety of, of, collect, of collecting interests, is, is that applicable to you as well? We heard, a, we heard quite a few different uh, categories. Oh, in terms yeah. of like medium? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was my first question as you were talking, like how do you live with land art, which is um, such an amazing... Not very easy. Not very easily, I guess. <laughs> not in New York City. Yes. <laughs> No, I think, that's, I think that's always a good thing. I mean, I think as a collector, you always want to be... The thing that you're afraid of, or the thing that you think you can't live with, or you shouldn't live with, or I can't, I can't hang this in my home, or I can't... You should, like, pay attention to that and question it, you know, when you can reasonably question it. Because often those are the acquisitions that will, that will be most um, fruitful to you in some way. Because it'll force you out of your comfort zone, forces you to think about, you know, how to live with art in a different way. And I think it also shows other people that you're sort of thinking outside of the box, that you're not just buying cookie cutter art. Uh, so if it's uncomfortable and if it scares you, don't run away immediately. <laughs> Sometimes you can't, you know. But that was, that's what I would take away from what Ann was saying. Thank you. Uh, questions? Anyone? Lindsay, my colleague. Thank you, this is wonderful. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about all these objects you own, how you, how you care for them, how you make sure that, um, you know, that they're, if they are light sensitive or get dusty or all those kinds of things, if you could tell us about that. You just keep looking at them all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, I, in fact, I just today was approving a, a cleaning bill for a piece we have. Um, and because I noticed it was incredibly dusty and didn't want to touch it. Um, but you just look. I mean, the, the photographs, you know, you can't put them in direct sunlight. Um, but I also just think if I want to live with it, you know, I want to live with it. I'm not, I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to buy something that I... You're not going to be a prisoner I, of your art. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I would be sad. And, and in fact, we... Had a, we had our house in East Hampton, which was filled with art, and we had a fire, unfortunately. And much of it, a bunch of it was destroyed. And that was really, really tough, especially a um, couple of really favorite pieces. Um, so, you, you know, you care for them, but you also have to go with life, you know, and be responsible, but not crazy, is what I say. I don't know. I don't know about Bernard. And when you have kids, forget yeah. it. They're, like, oh throwing my. footballs yeah. in your living room, and, you know, it's a problem. <laughs> I mean, I think you are, you know, people often ask, oh, well, what, you know, what piece would you, 
<laughs> right. If your house Take is burning it. down, what piece would you run out with? And I'm always saying, well, my daughter Lucy loves art and makes these amazing, you know, collages. By the way, the answer is, because I was in the house, your phone and your kid. Yeah, your phone. That's what you take. <laughs> you don't actually take any art. Right, exactly. So. Um, in that order? Yeah. The phone uh, and yeah, the kid. Yeah, actually. <laughs> well, the kid doesn't the phone um, attached anyway. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, I mean, I think art teaches you, there's a lot of, there are some sort of, um, life lessons I think that art teaches you and they're not always so obvious I think art is an object it's something you possess it's material but I think the way that Anne and I have been talking about collecting is that you know yeah of course we own we collect we own these objects but often these objects move on to a different life you donate them to a museum or they're lost in a fire or they're passed down or, or your kids sell or them when kid, you die. Or your kids sell them That's before you die. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think what Anne was talking about in terms of you, you look at things and you, you're, you're caring for them. I mean, I think people often say you're a custodian. Like, in the museum sense, the museum is a custodian of, of artworks and protects them for posterity so that future generations can enjoy it. But even in the context of your own collection, you can be a custodian. And I think once you recognize that role and you sort of front face that role, then you know, it kind of relieves you of some of the, you know, the possessiveness around work and your attitude and your relationship toward it changes. And then you really do think more about, I wanna take good care of this because it's not always, this piece of art is gonna outlive me. It's gonna outlive my children. I wanna make sure that it's there when it outlives my children and myself. So I think that you can, you know, conservation and care for artwork has... Storage, proper storage proper, is, a, is yeah. definitely a thing. Yeah. I mean, the work belongs, it's funny doing this, like, book about, working on a book about our collection, and it's, you know, what, one of the things I've learned from our, thanks to our copyright person, is that, you know, we own the object, but the artist owns the image. In other words, you can hang your painting wherever you want, and give it to someone, or put it in storage, or put it under your bed, but in order to reproduce that artwork, to get permission to show it in a book or a catalog or a magazine, you have to get permission from the artist. So, and that really makes you, if you think about that, it really does. Or the artist's estate, or if the, the artist is no longer living. Exactly. So. so, you know, you own the artwork, yes, but you know, there's a lot of asterisks attached to that, in, in, a, in a good way most of the time, I think. Uh, we had a question from Anne's husband and from my direct colleague. So maybe, maybe we can open it up a little bit. Ah, here, in the front. Here we go. Oh, sorry, you're, you're next. Yeah, sorry. Quite a primitive question, but you know, sometimes even artists... A little bit closer to the mic, yeah, sorry. Well, sometimes even artists feel ashamed of the work they made, you know, 10 years ago. But what do you do? Do you... Do you keep loyal to your to the works you you you, had ch you chose a long time ago? What do you do with them? I've actually never had that experience where an yeah, artist just, yeah, said they just, were they were ashamed of the work they had made. I think most often they sort of it's not that just, they forget about them, but they let them go. Yeah, you know, well, we they have to, it. and so I'm not sure they revisit <laughs> them so much in their minds and say, "I've never had that." Have you ever had that? Well, you don't have early uh, Jasper Jones, then. Right. <laughs> Actually, I do have oh, one too. But, but he hasn't been to my house, so he hasn't been able to tell me. <laughs> and don't submit them to the catalog. <laughs> uh, no, I've just had funny interactions with artists, again, living, who come over and then they see who they're hung next to. Oh, yes, that and definitely. they're like, oh, Bernard, you know, she and I used to go out. Or like, <laughs> oh, I don't talk to that person. Like, so that's kind of funny. But yeah, the shame has less to do with the quality of the art or the, than who they're with. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to framing. Um, in, in, in regards to, do you feel that like you can add or change the art in, in your personal way by maybe changing the framing? If it's been framed by the artist, is that different than if it's been framed by the Yes, if it's framed by the artist, I don't change it. Um, if it's, you know, I bought it on the secondary market, a photograph, and it has some frame that I, or often the mat is wrong, 
on a lot of pieces. It's either way too big or it's way too small. Or um, so yes, very often, so as long as I you change, can change the, the framing, decade each each like changing the furniture. No, or? mostly once and then never once. again. Yeah. And you said your your tastes change. Um, so to, to freshen it, yeah, try, try I, I it in the a new light. My frames, because I don't have, you know, um, 18th century work. Or the, the frames are quite simple, usually. Wood, um, you know, painted or, or bleached or something. And so they're not, they're, they're, they can go from taste to taste, usually. How, not how gilded that, frames. In, how would that... Um, Reconcile with like, like historical. Did did the, uh, the the things we see on the frick walls? They obviously, or maybe not obviously, not framed by the artists, and they their frames have been changed over yeah, the years. Yeah, there are some great time. framers that you I take a piece to and have a conversation with them about the frame, you know, and they ha they do have historical context. They you know they're talking to you about no, that will not look good on this piece. It's too. You know, it, it doesn't fit the time period or the... Um, yeah, there are some incredibly knowledgeable framers and, and even yeah. framers who will not even touch an 18th century frame, even though you ask them, I want you to make that smaller because I need it for a smaller artwork and they will just not touch it because it's an 18th century frame. Sorry, I'm, I'm just a moderator, yeah. but this, this no. is something that... <laughs> right. I don't think I have any 18th century frames, but um, it's very important to the picture. Going through the pictures that are gonna be in the show at the Met has been very interesting because, um, you know, Jeff, the curator, we stand in front of a picture and he says to me, you know, this mat is, is too big and the picture is too small on it, something that I might not have even ever really thought about. Um, and, you know, this is what he does for a living, so he sees it in a different way. Uh, and he's, he said he's gonna reframe a few things, but mostly, he thought they were pretty good. Um, but yeah, framing is very important, very. I went to um, Crystal Bridges a few months ago in, in Arkansas, Alice Walton's museum, and she had an exhibit. It was very interesting. She had an exhibition of um, uh, 19th century paintings and then some contemporary paintings by African-American artists. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed, I said to the curator who walked me around, why are all the, the 18th century paintings in these gilded frames and all the paintings by African Americans are in simple wood frames, like in the same room? And she said, oh my God, I never noticed that. And she didn't, and to me it was, it was very weird, you know, it, it really, changed the tenor of the show for me because I thought, what are you trying to reinforce <laughs> that? I mean, I wasn't sure if it was intentional or not. I, I don't think it was intentional, which is maybe even worse, but... Um, <laughs> so, so would that mean that as a collector you take license to change the frames? Yeah. Yes, but again, not if the artist did it. I, I, I defer to the artist. No. No, I think I would still leave it. So we have time for no one more question and then. Okay, here we go. It's just a mat. I forgot that. Hi, thank you both. It's been so informative. I was curious, um, you know, when you're acquiring a piece from an artist or a dealer, do you, have you ever asked for any sort of accompanying artifacts such as, you know, like the, the sketch that led to the painting or the print? I think with furniture, my second addiction is um, Nakashima, like American arts and crafts furniture. And the great thing of- You should and, stay here another hour because the there's more, more coming up. <laughs> In next week's lecture. Um, the great thing about <laughs> Nakashima, who is, you know, a woodworker and an artist, um, by all sense of the word, is that they, you know, he kept in, one of the things that auction houses use to authenticate his pieces is the order card, the original order card for the piece, which usually includes a sketch that the artist made of the piece, and, you know, it has the person's name on it who ordered it, and, um, 
and they frequently supply that as authenticating evidence of the work. Um, but for contemporary, I mean, for living artists, it's, again, it's, I don't think there's any. Yeah, I, no, I would say no, um, only in terms of many pieces, if they're, they've been exhibited, um, have the stickers on the back uh, from right. the museum shows. And that's sort of the only documentation that, I mean, you get sometimes some kind of certificate ensuring that it's, authentic, but right. I've never I've never asked for any other kind of ephemera. Um, I think they, you know, they don't, they keep it. The artists keep it. Um, we helped to acquire Diane Arbus's um, collection of ephemera. So all of her inspiration, mm. um, you know, so they're not gonna, I think it's very personal and not necessarily part of the piece, usually. That's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah, Louisa, one, one, one thing I want to... Uh, no, first of all, I want to thank you <laughs> for organizing this. And, and where's Samantha? Yeah, thank you, Samantha, of course. And uh, thank you for being so inspiring. I, what, we, we can learn so much. I, I always love to meet people who are willing to learn, and that's what we've actually learned, what you can gain when you're willing to learn. And I'm very much impressed by what the two of you are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you.